Tessia took another step forward, less hesitant this time. Arthur? Is that you? She asked again, her voice seeming to catch in her throat. Everyone there, each of the soldiers, augmenters, and conjurers alike, turned to watch their leader as she approached the man sitting atop the hill of corpses. Then the silence that had filled the cavern was broken by a bright chirp. As if out of nowhere, a streak of white shot toward Tessia and landed in her arms. It looked like some sort of miniature white fox. Sylvie, Tessia exclaimed, embracing the creature before looking back up at the figure on the hill of bodies. You, state your name. Drogo's usually confident voice wavered at the sight before them. The blue-eyed man regarded him in silence for a moment, and Drogo took a step back. Finally, he answered, Arthur Lewin. Prying his bloodied sword out of the corpse it was embedded in, Arthur leapt deftly down to the stone floor, coming to a stop in front of the large doorway. He stepped out of the shadow, and they could finally make out his features, which had been shrouded in darkness. Arthur appeared young despite the aura that emanated from him. Tousled, shoulder-length auburn hair contrasted with his bright eyes, which seemed composed, casual, almost, even in this situation. The splatters of blood and grime that darkened his face and clothes did nothing to diminish his looks. He wasn't glamorous, nothing like the noblemen they'd seen, who carried themselves with chests puffed out and noses pointed so high up that they might as well have been looking at the sky. No, behind his nonchalant gaze and slightly curled lips was an air of sovereignty that transcended any of those peacock nobles, fluttering their power like colorful plumage. Sheathing his teal sword in an unadorned black scabbard, Arthur took a step toward them with his hands upraised. I'm on your side, he said wearily. The soldiers all exchanged uncertain glances as Tessia took another step forward. Then several members of the Twin Horns ran up with cries of, Arthur? Tessia, however, remained where she was. Tessia and Arthur stared at each other for a brief moment, and it seemed he even gave a faint smile but neither of them approached the other. Tessia's behavior had caught Stannard off guard, but the Twin Horn's actions seemed to dissipate the tension and suspicion that had filled the cavern. At the same time, it raised more questions in his head. Assuming this really was the Arthur Lewin Tessia had told them so much about, what was he doing here? How did he get here? Had he killed the S-Class mutant by himself? That's impossible, another soldier yelled. How can a mere boy do, by himself, what a whole battalion of mages set out to do? Arthur simply raised a brow, seeming unaffected. It really doesn't matter whether you believe me or not. The fact is, the mutant you were ordered to kill is now dead. More soldiers began shouting questions and accusations, but the mysterious man ignored them all. He extended a hand to Drogo and said, You seem to be the leader of this expedition. Do you mind letting me stay at your camp tonight? I'm rather spent and would like a decent night's rest before heading out. Drogo seemed dumbfounded, but he just accepted the handshake and nodded wordlessly. What about all the beast cores? A bearded conjurer asked, pointing at the mountain of mana beasts. Once again, everyone exchanged glances in the hopes of somehow finding answers. Usually, beast cores were collected after a battle and divided amongst the soldiers. Looking at the sheer number of corpses stacked up into that hill, even the most unambitious man would drool at the potential to be gained. They're all gone, Arthur answered quietly. Sorry, but my bond has quite a large appetite for beast cores. He pointed to the furry white fox cleaning itself at Tessia's feet. Are you saying that little thing just devoured hundreds of beast cores? A burly augmenter asked in disbelief as his hand gripped tightly at the handle of his sword. Yes, Arthur responded matter-of-factly. What about the S-Class Mutant's Beast Corps? What happened to that? Drogo asked, regaining his composure. I have it, Arthur let out a sigh. Any more questions? I'll be happy to debrief later, but standing around answering everyone's questions isn't exactly the best use of our time. We'll escort him back to base, leader, Tessia said, and the members of the Twin Horns all nodded in agreement. Very well. For now, I want a few teams to stay behind to look for any stragglers and collect anything worth selling. The rest of us will go back to camp and wait for further instructions, Drogo ordered, 
placating the dissatisfied soldiers. The trip back to the main camp was almost as tense and stifling as the trip down had been. Caria, Darvis, and Stannard all stayed silent, but the sour mood of almost every soldier present weighed down on their shoulders. Even Tessia and the Twin Horns kept their conversations with Arthur down to hushed, indiscernible whispers. Behind them, the soldiers engaged in various conversations. Some expressed relief at avoiding a battle, while others were disappointed by the absence of beast corps and bounties. A few voiced frustration at missing the chance to confront a powerful mana beast. However, irrespective of their individual sentiments about Arthur's sudden appearance, a pervasive emotion lingered among them. Fear. Upon their return to the main camp, Arthur made his way directly to the bathing stalls near the stream. Tessia and the twin horns accompanied Drogo into his private tent. Well, that was anticlimactic, Darvis sighed, settling down next to the fading embers of their campfire. I'd say it was pretty eventful, Curia countered. Did you see that pile of mana beasts and that giant mutant? Even with all of us combined, I doubt we'd have come out unscathed from a fight like that. Exactly, Darvis exclaimed. That guy, Arthur, how the hell was he able to kill them all, if he really did kill them in the first place? Stannard shook his head. What? You think the guy was sitting there posing, waiting for us to show up so he could take the credit? Well, I'm not sure about that, but I mean, it's not natural. Tessia said he was around her age, which means he's a bit younger than us. What kind of fiery pit did he have to grow up in to become a monster like that? Darvis gave a sigh, looking down at the pair of axes he had been fumbling with. If he really was able to single-handedly kill all those mana beasts, along with an S-class mutant, what are guys like us needed for? Do I smell a hint of jealousy? Korea smirked, lightly prodding Darvis with her elbow. You mean envy, Caria. Stannard corrected on impulse. She turned to him. What's the difference? Jealousy is what you feel when you worry someone will take something you possess. Envy is longing after something someone else has. Stannard shook his head. You know what? Never mind. It's not important. Caria just shrugged and placed a hand on her childhood friend's shoulder. Anyway, he's just one person, Darvis. No matter how strong he is, it's not like he can win the war by himself. You saw the state he was in. He wasn't really hurt, but he seemed pretty worn out. Darvis rolled his eyes. Thanks. At least he was tired after single-handedly wiping out an army of mana beasts and an S-class mutant. No need to get snarky with me, Darvis. I'm just trying to help. Korea snapped, her cheeks turning red. Well, don't. I don't need your pity. Besides, that guy isn't natural. No point in comparing myself to a freak of nature like him. I don't know. He seems pretty normal to me, Stannard chimed in. Putting his strength aside, he seemed like a decent person while he was talking to the twin horns. Yeah, I even spotted a smile when he saw Tessia, Korea added, smirking. Although I was expecting something more, like a passionate hug or something. Please, you saw the way he talked to everyone. He was a snobby jerk, Darvis said, shaking his head. Well, everyone was kind of a jerk to him, Stannard countered. He didn't know why he was defending Arthur, but sometimes Darvis really rubbed him the wrong way. Whenever a situation didn't go his way, Darvis always pointed fingers and made assumptions to feel better about himself. Darvis's eyes narrowed. Why are you taking his side? I'm not technically taking his side. Stannard shook his head. I just think it's naive to form impressions of the guy without even holding a conversation with him. You've heard how Tessia always talks about him. Don't you think we should give him the benefit of the doubt? Tessia's mind is probably clouded by her childhood memories. Darvis scoffed. You saw the tension between them. Hey, maybe you finally have a shot with her. Stannard couldn't take it anymore. Are you that petty? You sound like a child, bringing me into this. You're drawing conclusions about Arthur based on what exactly? Boys, let's not fight, Caria said, her eyes shifting from Stannard to Darvis. I'm basing it off my instinct, twerp, Darvis hissed, standing up. Maybe that's something you can't do because of your deformed mana core. 
Stannard could feel the blood rushing to his head at the insult. Well, at least I don't need to convince myself and everyone else that someone better than me must be a monster just so I can keep my worthless pride intact. He spat. Darvis's face turned red too, and he shook with rage. He threw the hatchet he had been white-knuckling down to the ground, then whipped around, stomped to their tent, and slipped inside. Stannard. Korea came over to him after watching her best friend go. You know he didn't mean that, right? You know how he gets when he's all riled up. With a sigh, Stannard mustered up a faint smile for her. I'm fine. It's not like it's the first time we've had one of these fights. I don't butt heads with him as often as Tessia does, but that's mainly because I just hold it in. But sometimes I can't endure it and I explode. You're right though, Caria replied after a moment of silence. Darvis is much better than he was back then, but being born into nobility, he was handed everything. Wealth, resources, attention, even talent. A whole lot of good that does him if he's still an ass. Stannard rolled his eyes. Look, Korea, I'm not mad at you. I'm not even mad at what Darvis said. I'm just tired of his narcissism, that ego that pops up no matter how much you try to shove it down. Karia giggled. Tell me about it. I've known him for more than 12 years, and I bet a rabid mana beast could mature faster than Darvis. But he's gotten a lot better since he met you and Tessia. That's a fact. Yeah, I know. Stannard nodded, already thinking of a way to break the ice with his egocentric teammate. Korea and Stannard stoked the fire until it was blazing again and sat around it for a while longer, just talking. They stood up when they noticed two shadowy figures approaching the campsite. Hey guys, Tessia's voice rang out. As the shapes drew closer, Stannard could make out her form and the man next to her. I'd like you to meet my childhood friend, Arthur, she said once they reached them, putting a hand on his arm. As Stannard approached them, he noticed that her eyes were a bit red. His hair still damp from his bath, Arthur dipped his head. Stannard Barrick and Korea Ride, right? Nice to meet you, and thank you for taking care of my friend. I know she can be quite a handful. This got a giggle from Korea, and Tessia jabbed an elbow into his ribs. Seeing the two of them like this made Stannard question the feeling he'd had when he had first seen Arthur. Without the blood covering most of his face, it was safe to say Arthur was indeed the enemy of all single men. His features were sharp, but not overly so, with a subtle charm that went beyond just the textbook standard of handsome. His reddish-brown hair was long, as if he hadn't gotten a proper trim in years, but it only served to highlight the untamed, wild quality he had about him. He was a head taller than Tessia, which made him quite tall for his age. Their leader was just a few inches shorter than Darvis. Though he wore a loose-fitting robe, it was evident that his physique was that of a fighter. The way Arthur carried himself, the way he walked, and the way his eyes seemed to take in everything around him confirmed that the aura he exuded wasn't just Stannard's imagination. As Tessia and Arthur prepared to take a seat around our fire, Darvis stormed out of his tent. When he passed by Stannard, he shot him the embarrassed look he always wore when he was about to apologize, but Stannard stopped him with a hand. With a smirk, Stannard mouthed, It's fine, twerp. Darvis rubbed the back of his neck as he flashed Stannard a wry smile, but then his gaze hardened as he faced Arthur. Tessia, Caria, and Stannard all looked at him, wondering what he might say. Then, Darvis lifted a finger and said loudly, Arthur Lewin. I, Darvis Clarell, fourth son of Clarell House, formally challenge you to a duel. The image of Arthur on top of that mountain of corpses, drenched in blood, looking down at them with a cold glare, had been burned into Tessa's head for hours now. She had recognized him almost immediately, but her voice had stuck in her throat. She couldn't call out to him. She was scared to. Even after she'd gathered the courage to finally say his name, he stayed silent. Fear, a worry that something had changed in him during his training, immediately filled her mind as he faced them. She was delighted when Sylvie popped out, but she couldn't get rid of the unease in her chest, even when Arthur finally spoke. 
The sight of him stepping into the light made her heart feel like it had twisted into a knot. He was filthy, and his exhaustion was clear in his eyes. But it really was Arthur. Tess wanted to embrace him right there, just as the twin horns were doing. But something held her back. Looking at her childhood friend, she sensed a clear distance that went beyond the few yards that separated them. And so, she stood still, anchored, and just gave him a hesitant smile, one that didn't even reach her eyes. He smiled back, but it was only for a moment. Then the soldiers began questioning him. Throughout the trip back to the main camp, Arthur stayed relatively silent while the twin horns chattered around them. They were all excited to have him back, despite the obvious discontent of the soldiers. Arthur smiled when spoken to and responded, but his replies were brief, and he didn't initiate any conversations. As soon as they arrived at the camp, he spotted the stream and went to wash up with Sylvie. Tess went straight to the main tent with Drogo and the twin horns, hoping to dispel the tension their leader and the rest of the soldiers felt toward Arthur. He came to the main tent after he had washed up, but even without the blood and filth covering him, he was just as unapproachable. He debriefed only what was necessary, otherwise stating that he would report directly to her grandfather. Tess stayed silent throughout the short meeting, while Drogo and the twin horns bombarded him with questions. Drogo left first, informing the rest of the soldiers of their next course of action. The twin horns reluctantly agreed to let Arthur rest only after being promised a more detailed account of the battle later. Then, Arthur and Tess were the only ones left in the tent. She remained tense, staring at her feet, and feeling Arthur's gaze boring into her. She didn't know what to say, how to act, or even how to feel. She was at a loss. Arthur had suddenly appeared in front of her after more than two years, and he was acting so distant. Whatever confidence she might have had went out the window as she considered her pitiful state. Here she was, dressed like a man, layered from head to toe with grime and soot. Worst of all, her hair was a bird's nest, and she smelled like weak old garbage. How could she approach him? How could she approach Arthur in this state? He walked over to her, each of his footfalls making her heart beat just a little bit faster, but she refused to look up. As he came closer, she could smell the faint aroma of herbs clinging to him. Don't come closer, she prayed. Surely he'd be repulsed by her stench. His feet stopped just in front of hers, but her eyes stayed glued to the ground, and she squirmed awkwardly. For a moment, they were both silent. The only sound she could hear was the beating of her uncooperative heart. It's been a while, Tess, Arthur finally said. I missed you. At those few words, the ice that had stiffened her body melted. Her vision became blurry, but still, she refused to look at anything but her feet. She clenched her fists to keep herself from shaking. Then her eyes betrayed her, and she saw the teardrops darkening the leather of her boots. Art's warm hand gently touched her arm, and part of her marveled at how large it was. She had known him since he was shorter than her, but now, the simple touch of his palm filled her with a sense of safety. She felt protected. She tried her hardest to stay firm, but she found herself sniffling uncontrollably as her body began quivering. She didn't exactly know what it was that had reduced her to such a state. Maybe it was finally seeing her childhood friend again. Maybe it was that his words had confirmed that he was still truly himself, not the cold killer she had thought he had turned into when she first saw him. Or, it might not have had anything to do with that at all. She couldn't truthfully explain why every barrier she had unconsciously raised to help her endure these last two years had just come crumbling down. All she felt was a wave of relief, that everything was okay now, that she didn't have to worry anymore. It suddenly felt like everything Grandpa, Master Aldir, and all the rest had been worrying about would all be okay, now that Art was here. It was funny how a person could do that, how one person could make you feel truly safe. Art, you idiot. She choked out between sniffles. She raised her fist to hit him, but by the time they reached his chest, there was no strength behind them. She must have shouted every profanity she knew at him, yelling at him for just about everything, his cold attitude, his tastelessly long hair, which made him look scary, his lack of contact until now, on and on, down to how her current state of mind was his fault. 
and Art just stood there, silently taking it all as his large hand continued to warm her arm. She was angry, she was frustrated, she was embarrassed, but she was relieved. The barrage of emotions turned her into a puddle of tears as she continued assaulting Art, mostly because she hated herself for how she was acting in that moment. She cried until she was exhausted, then rested her head against his chest, staring down at his feet, which were also spotted with her tears and subsiding into hiccups and sniffles. Finally, when they had both been quiet for a minute, she worked up the courage to look at his face, only to see him staring right back at her. She was about to turn away to hide her face, but his smile stopped her. It wasn't like the smile he had given her when they'd seen each other at the entrance to the mutant's lair. His eyes crinkled into two crescent moons, and his lips parted ever so slightly. You're still a crybaby, aren't you? He joked, removing his hand from her arm to wipe away a stray tear that clung to her cheek. Shut up, she replied hoarsely. With a soft chuckle, he motioned with his head for her to follow him. Come on, your friends must be waiting. Tess gave him a nod and picked up Sylvie, who had been rubbing against her leg and humming softly, almost like the purr of a cat. As they walked, her gaze constantly shifted between the sleeping Sylvie and Art. You got taller, she said. Sorry, I can't say the same for you. Art teased with a faint, weary smile. Tess stuck out her tongue. I'm tall enough. Tess spotted Korea and Stannard talking around their fire, and they picked up their pace while she tried her best to hide any signs that she had been crying. After she introduced Art, they were situating themselves around the fire when Darvis suddenly came stomping out with a determined expression. Arthur Lewin. I, Darvis Clarell, fourth son of Clarell House, formally challenge you to a duel, he announced. There was no particular anger or spite on his face. He simply looked resolute. What? They all exclaimed in unison, everyone except Art. Tessa's gaze immediately turned to Art to see how he would react. Given that he was physically and mentally drained from the past few hours, she didn't know how he would respond to such a confrontation. However, to her relief, she spotted an amused expression on her friend's face. Nice to meet you, Darvis Clarell, fourth son of Clarell House. May I ask the reason for this duel? Art replied without getting up. Korea had already jumped up and was holding Darvis by the arm. Don't mind him, Mr. Lewin. Please, just call me Arthur. Arthur, she amended. He's just being foolish. I'm fine, Caria. I'm not mad or anything. Darvis shook her away before facing Art again. It was weird to see Darvis speaking to Art in such a formal and respectful manner since Arthur was a few years younger than him. As for my reason, Darvis paused, then said, with all excuses aside, a man's pride. Tess was utterly baffled by his response and judging by the stunned expressions on Korea's and Stannard's faces, they shared the sentiment. However, Art covered his mouth to stifle a laugh. His shoulders shook as he tried to hold it back, but he finally broke out into a guffaw. They looked at each other with expressions of even greater confusion. Even Darvis looked bewildered. Soldiers, drawn in by Art's uncontained laughter, gathered around their fire, trying to figure out what was going on. Sorry, I didn't mean to offend, Art finally said, choking back his laughter. It's just that after spending what felt like a lifetime with those old coots, what you said was quite refreshing. Thank you, Darvis replied, trying to decide whether to be offended or pleased at Art's remark. Anyway, sure, as long as lives aren't at stake, I'm fine with a duel, Art said with a contented smile, getting up from the stump he was sitting on. The two men began making their way toward the southern wall of the cavern, the group of curious soldiers eagerly following behind them. Do you know what this is about? Tess asked Korea as the three of them trailed along behind them. Her petite teammate sighed and shook her head. I think he's feeling insecure because Arthur is younger than him, but supposedly stronger. He's pretty bitter that Arthur is better looking than him too, Stannard added. What? So that's what he meant by a man's pride? Tess blurted, dumbstruck. Yeah, I know. Caria nodded. He's hit a new low. I wonder if all men are like that. 
they turned to Stannard, who looked back at them with a raised brow, clearly unamused. On behalf of men, allow me to say that we aren't all like that. Maybe not all, but it has to be a majority, right? Karya asked, making Tess giggle. Stannard nodded and let out a defeated sigh. Probably. They got to the makeshift dueling grounds just in time to see them begin. It seemed the entire camp had stopped what they were doing to watch the two go at it. Tess could understand the soldiers being curious about Art's strength since they had only seen the aftermath of his fight. But she hadn't expected to see Drogo at the front, eagerly waiting next to the twin horns. Their leader, the usually impartial Helen, was enthusiastically rooting for Art along with the rest of her party. Soldiers from their expedition, who had all seen Darvis in action and knew of his prowess, cheered for him with whistles and hoots. Beside Tess, Caria groaned. Who am I supposed to root for? Shouldn't it obviously be your childhood crush? Tess teased, snickering at the sight of Darvis receiving the cheers with his chest puffed out pompously. Sylvie, who had fallen asleep in her arms, stirred at the noise from the crowd, taking a quick peek before deciding that her sleep was more important. We don't always have to side with our friends, Caria replied, shaking her head at Darvis's unseemly attitude. You kind of do, Caria. Stannard snorted, then turned his gaze toward Sylvie. I didn't want to ask before, but it's been on my mind. What sort of mana beast is Arthur's bond anyway? You wouldn't believe me even if I told you, Tess said with a grin, focusing on the duel. Art stood leisurely, his left hand leaning on the pommel of his sword as Darvis began juggling his axes, putting on a show for the crowd. Just before you came, Tess, he was in such a sour mood. Now look at him. God, I swear he has the emotional stability of a four-year-old, Korea grumbled. Probably not even that, Tess chuckled, remembering how mature Art had been at that age. One of the soldiers, a seasoned augmenter, volunteered himself to be the referee. He stood between Darvis and Art with an upraised hand. I'm sure the consensus is that we'd like to keep this cavern in one piece, so I want you both to keep mana usage strictly to body augmentations. Is that clear? The soldier asked, glancing at Drogo for confirmation. Drogo nodded in approval. When Darvis and Art both nodded their consent, the soldier said, First to yield or otherwise be incapacitated loses. Begin, and swung down his hand.